Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to Third Street Gallery. For those of you who are new to us, we are an artist cooperative, and our gallery is located at 610 South Third Street between Bainbridge and South. Um, today, we're really happy to have an artist talk by Jeremy Sims, who will be discussing uh, his work here at the gallery, um, as well as um, his methods and all of that other stuff. Good stuff. I give you Jeremy Sims. Greetings. Um, I'm gonna figure out a couple different ways to like get into the like uh, deeper content of the work. The title for the show that includes some ceramics, some functional ceramics, and the paintings that you see here on the wall is "Were We Not Already Wearing Masks?" Which asks a pretty straightforward question, but uh, my hope is that uh, really people spend some more time really diving into their relationship to themselves in a space that uh, they inhabit while also inhabiting uh, this space. Um, I suppose too, in terms of how I want people to feel interacting with the show is, I want people to, f I want folks to feel at home um, and relaxed and comfortable, but also curious. Um, I think for me, that's like something that I can't help but being. So like sharing what uh, is like inspiring or exciting w uh, with others in like various, uh, in like the languages that like come best, uh, easiest for me with like visual art is uh, something that like really pushes me a lot in the studio. Um, I think some folks might ask how the, uh, the functional objects and these sculptural ones and these visual paintings all kind of come together. And the uh, simple answer I'd have is that each one of these informed the other. The uh, paintings were er uh, early on very heavily inspired by my favorite things about the uh, glazes um, on my ceramic surfaces and then later as I started moving through these um, and like projecting these ideas of like making something that feels kind of like a landscape, but not this kind of landscape, but like this kind of a landscape, thinking more about how those surfaces and shapes could influence the way that I was thinking about the ceramic work too. So I, I really see them as being all one single body of work um, and all exploring kind of the same idea. And you know, uh, along with that too, they were all made by my hands. So there's at least that thing in common, if nothing else. Uh, so I picked four of the larger paintings. I have tons of the, uh, the large scale pieces, but uh, I didn't want to like overwhelm the gallery space. So I had uh, like, I tried to pare it down to a couple that felt like a, a bit like a complete sentence. And um, the, the larger pieces, like all of the rest of them, you'll kind of like notice they're probably hard to catch in camera. So there's a, like a lot of reflecting, which, um, was really intentional uh, with the show because I, I wanted people to see themselves embedded into the composition of the paintings. So like on like, a, like, a, on like an informal level, you are seeing like this like abstract like landscape that's kind of like a mindscape. And uh, for me is like usually me working through like some sort of any idea of like what is what is something that you're thinking before it gets translated into language as it like first appears in your head? Like what does that look like or like what does that feel like? How can that be represented in like other ways? And I wanted to kind of like put people in that space like almost as literally as I could and also give people this like opportunity to either like reflect in like a figurative and literal way uh, on uh, their own relation to the work and uh, anything else that like might be in uh, their head or also like figuratively and literally kind of like look past themselves in order to like actually see the full composition on its own. So it's like a little bit of a thing of my, my arts, uh, like I wanna try and make these like look back at you a little bit while you're looking at it. Um, <clears throat> And like some of these are very clearly like, uh, it's kind of really inspired by how, um, how do I put this into words? It's like, uh, I used to see a bunch of diagrams in uh, high school about the way that like electricity moves through like wiring. And uh, they use these like really pared down symbols to explain everything and uh, I spent a lot of time with these really sort of like thinking about uh, what 
things look like on like a molecular level or like a, on like a very, very, very small level. So small that like even regular sized things can suddenly be or feel massive. And like, what does that look like? What does that feel like? How can I put someone in that? Um, so like there's these like circles sort of like moving in between these like spaces that are made with like the opposite of whatever sort of field they're in. But it's also this like space that they can kind of like travel through. And for me, that's kind of like either like a cable or like a neuron. Um, or just like a visual symbol that a person could project their own ideas or like uh, representation onto. I had someone at the show ask me about why the circle was so important. And uh, the, the answer, which I'll, I'll eventually get to, starts with like a really, uh, at a really silly beginning where I was thinking when I was making these about wanting to have like some sort of a visual anchor. So like with this painting, for example, you keep moving around this space, but if there was like, if it was just the color field, it, you could get lost really easily. So I wanted to have things that people could like move back to as they're moving around through the image that are also embedded in it. So like this one's kind of got these like streaks as if these balls are kind of like moving to the left. But, but that, uh, visual cue as a mental anchor for thinking about like the movement of like something from one place to another felt like a good place to uh, start when I was thinking about wanting to like make points that people could use to kind of embed themselves in these paintings and have like a bit of a more intimate relationship than like just the distance of like themselves looking into like an open space. Um. The painting, correct me if I'm wrong, the moment seems like you have more control. There's the moment you put something in the kiln that's out of your control. <laughs> uh, and so what's your thought process of doing these and are you ever surprised with what comes out? <laughs> Uh, sometimes. I, I feel like there's the same level of control in a certain way. Um, partly because like, I, I spent a long time like really practicing and figuring out like the, the thermodynamics of like my kiln and like doing lots of testing and like trial and error. And like there are lots of these paintings that like I'm not going to show to anyone because they were when I was still figuring out like creating the kinds of color fields that I wanted to make. But uh, I'd say I, my, I think my uh, first answer to that would probably be something that I remember one of my painting instructors, David Cloutier, saying where he like just kind of asked the, like, the students, how can you randomly choose? Like the sort of idea of if you choose randomness, that's an active decision that is informing randomness. So it's not entirely random. It's a choice to make the choice open. And uh, every single one of these are like very curated, um, like kind of chaos in that it's literally just paint running down that way, paint running to the side or paint running to this side. But uh, it's after doing so much testing to a point where like the brush strokes because of uh, how quickly I'm like painting the water on before doing the washes still show through in the paint because the ink settles in those a little bit more as the, uh, the brush bristles kind of like make their own like tiny little divots in the canvas. Or like this piece here kind of has these like slash marks in it because I took a uh, spray bottle and just very quickly like and the, the water pushed deeper into the, the paper in the spots where I sprayed versus other areas. So that's, uh, there's like a lot of control in specific part uh, play, uh, ways and then everything else is kind of like left open for like opportunity and uh, that idea was really informed by ceramics for me because uh, there's, there's a lot in ceramics that feels very open and like not in control. Things are, things are out of your control and like pottery has some very simple truths to it in that if you don't do something right, it will explode or it will shatter. Um, and so you, you, have to, you have to be open to like accidents or making mistakes, but those also inform the next decision. So there, there is kind of a lack of control in like the fluidity of the glaze, but 
every, uh, every other aspect of this was very deliberately decided, such as like this glaze that I've created that has, uh, whew, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> this glaze I've been making that, uh, working with that has this like iron saturate and uh, a flux in the glaze that like has it melt at a lower melting point. So this, uh, this cup, after I glazed it, just like one solid glaze, sat in a kiln at like a held temperature. So the, the glaze itself had some time to melt and like really start flowing, while the iron crystals uh, started to like form crystalline patterns in the glaze matrix itself. And that's all just like based off of knowledge and like lots and lots and lots and lots of like trial and kiln error and kind of also informing like the knowledge of, okay, well, if I do things like this and like this and like this, it will come out this way. I'm trying to be as like deliberate as possible, even in ceramics, which I know is like sometimes kind of counterintuitive. Like it's, it's given me this like different perspective on like, r like randomness of like, even, even chaotic elements of something can still be, uh, and usually are in control, like uh, being controlled somehow. Like, uh, Marcel Duchamp's paintings where he was like dropping paper and like making them into single compositions. It's not really clear if he actually kept every single one of those after he dropped the paper. Um, and it was also his choice to create a composition like that and he chose paper and like shapes that were based on what he was gonna do. So the, the total like act of creation is all of the steps leading up to the making of the work. The way that I would, uh, that I'm thinking, I've been thinking about these as like a surprise. For me, it's usually something more of starting a painting, I already have an idea of like how I want it to come out. So usually sometimes it's like a thing of, well, what if I tried this and this and this together? I'm pretty sure it would make this image that I have in my head. So for, usually for me, it's more of a thing of, yes, I was right, versus like a couple of these where they, they kind of went in like a non-objective start and came around into like more interesting answers to things. Like this painting was entirely spontaneous, uh, but I'm really happy with how it turned out as like this sort of like cliff face type of painting that's like holding this like Vanta black orb together in this like really precarious sort of way, but also no part of it is actually a cliff because there's just like running bits of like paint making this thing. And like the more you sit with it, the more you realize, no, I'm not actually looking at any landscape. This is just an abstract painting, but it also looks so close to a landscape and like a physical thing. It's almost like a, I could like reach out and like pull that orb out of the painting. I wanted to really make these like internal uh, sort of like um, images and like put someone in like a place that feels more like surreal and like open to symbolism, but also like more like closer to like a more Jungian or like primordial aspect of that rather than like the, the way that like symbolism and like surreal symbolism or like internal symbolism tends to be represented in like American art with like a, David Lynch or like Salvador Dali, which like are both very, um, very much based on things that we see in, in like reality, kind of like jumbled up and put back together in like these crazy, super imaginative ways. And uh, I wanted to move to something that was like on a more fundamentally basic level. Um, so the, the sculptures are usually this thing of like, me trying to create something that like I've never seen in ceramics before, or I've never tried to do myself in ceramics to see how doable or not doable it might be. So there's like kind of some things that uh, like in these that I think a lot of folks might uh, think to, uh, like might have thought were like really challenging or like impossible with like the this sculpture over here that's got an entire top portion that's just sculpted out of slip. I just got like a dropper and put a droplet down, waited for that to dry, put a droplet down, waited for that to dry, put another down, waited for it to dry, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. And eventually I had a little sippy cup. <laughs> um, 
and uh, this one over here, the, the top part is held together. The, uh, these are like little porcelain toothpicks being held together with uh, just glaze that uh, I caught at a very particular temperature with a uh, glaze body that has like a little bit of clay in it, but also has like just enough um, of like a couple different uh, chemicals to make it pull sodium that turns into a glossy surface straight out of the air uh, as it's like sitting waiting to go into the kiln. And uh, it, it tipped a little bit, but um, <clears throat> I was actually very impressed by how it uh, managed to like hold everything together. And I, I kind of saw a little bit of myself in 2020 and 2021 in that sculpture as it came out of the kiln. And I was like, wow, man, there's, there's so much that this piece is trying to like balance and it's, it's doing it just barely. Um, and uh, this uh, other sculpture over here that's, um, like I've never tried half the things in here that I, that I had done on this piece for the very first time. And like, I, I like to kind of leave these as like idea, like uh, things that are just being explored experimentally. Um, and also they just, they take forever to make because <laughs> they're, they're like fired to one temperature, fired again, slightly lower, fired again, slightly lower, fired again, slightly lower, again, again, and again, and again, and again. There's like two more entirely different surfaces and looks underneath this finished one that's like kind of breaking through in some spots. And I kind of, I, I really love that, uh, that surface um, because for me, this is kind of doing what these are doing in that uh, it's kind of showing you that there's a lot more that you don't see you just see a little bit of what's implied beyond what you're actually seeing. It's like one of the reasons why I think I really wanted to start showing the paintings with like the ceramic sculpture because I, I wanted to create an opportunity for folks to like have their own takes and impressions on the work and like get to like sit with it and live with it. Um, <clears throat> but also on the subject of like this sculpture that I keep deviating from, uh, <laughs> it's uh, like all of these were like tons of different experiments all kind of like put together with like tons of different glazes all over them. And uh, this one was just this top half and just this bottom half being held together by some of the glaze similarly, uh, similar to this sculpture. And uh, I kind of really like that way of like making ceramic art. Is like for me, one of my favorite things when I saw like Wrights and Volkos and like the big abstract expressionist ceramicists was uh, not necessarily the scale, but uh, the ideas they were exploring of like making more complex objects by like putting them together in new creative ways. And in a lot of ways, I think that like the potter's wheel or like uh, the like pinch coil slab method of like hand building kind of like limits and like spoils ceramicists by making folks think that like that's that's it like once you've learned those techniques like you're done make whatever you want um and uh i kind of really much prefer the uh, way of like just sort of exploring or like having a space to explore the nature of uh ceramics which is very technical um, there's lots of chemistry involved. There's lots of like, uh, the scientific method in terms of like just figuring out whether or not a surface actually works, lots of failure. And, um, where's it going with that? And like, I think being open in, uh, ceramics is like a really valuable gift that you can give yourself while you're just sort of like exploring your relationship with like your own art. This is a, a bit of an older one, but it's from the same body of work. Um, prior shows that I've had were exclusively uh, sculptural, though there were like painterly elements to it. Even the paintings were sculptures, like the painting would like come off of the wall and have like a ceramic uh, like addition or two that like incorporated the, the 2D space into like the 3D. And um, a lot of what I've usually described my aesthetic as is like Ikea hellscapes. Um, and like at the time of like making this, 
I had already decided that I didn't want to bother with pedestals. Um, and I still don't, mostly because like I, I very strongly feel as though it's important to, if you're going to be a sculptor, to not just have work that occupies space, but have work that changes it. That kind of like a thinking about how a person intuitively interacts with like not just the art, but the space it occupies really felt like a, a, a more honest way of thinking about sculpture. And uh, then outside of that, I really like to give myself technical challenges. So making an architectural sculptural object that had to shrink to fit an exact size so that it could sit on this like giant chunk of uh, plexi um, was more just like me wanting to continue perfecting my craft. Like in the case of like functional objects, like uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the utility. Like one of these cups would, uh, would likely sell faster and it's the one that looks like it's the most natural to use. But both of these objects are worthy of like a deeper study because from this one, for example, you are never going to not be paying attention to this object when you're using it because there's just so many ways you can interact with it. This like circular aspect here that's very textured or this like stuff that just looks like paint scraped onto the side that's uh, actually just more of that glaze. And um, using, the, uh, using this object is like part of the intention that it forces you to look at it while you're doing it and like turn your attention away from whatever you're doing. Whereas you like, yeah, and like thinking about how you interact with it. Like there are other people who might hold this differently than me. Um, for example, like I usually actually hold stuff like this if it doesn't have a handle or from like the top, mostly because usually the center is hot um, until it's like just very comfortably warm. Um, and like likewise, this is a very beautiful object, but uh, it's also one that would be much harder to like think about as you're using it. Like uh, I, I used to have a lot of cups that I drink out of and like there were some that I started noticing, like I wouldn't notice when the tea was gone, for example. <laughs> and like to me that that's like a sim, uh, symbol of like, or like a, a sign, uh, that's what I'm looking for. That kind of informed me that like the objects were made to be too smooth to use. And um, for me, a lot of the like art making here, especially these like very heavily textured objects that like are deliberately rough and like might not be the most comfortable thing to use versus these other ones that are more smooth and elegant, but like still kind of like pull you in as an object. No, because it seems almost like um, you know, in organizational theory we talk about how structure shapes but doesn't determine. How so? Um, structure shapes how our actions but doesn't determine our actions. And in some ways you seem to be pushing that envelope. So as you say, with the wand, it's like, oh, it's very nice, and I'm going to put it down when the tea is done. Whereas the other one, you have to think about how you're interacting with it. You have to think about how it is shaping. It's determining an action on you, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, just shaping an experience or an action or something. Right. Well, it's, it's like the paintings that look back at you. Yeah. Like you're, you have to, like in the paintings, you have to like do some extra work to like really, uh, really appreciate them. And also there's multiple ways to interact with the objects mm -hmm. or with like the paintings themselves. And likewise with these, like not everybody's actually going to use all of them, which like personally, I try to make functional objects to be functional. Um, and I think a lot of folks would consider a lot of these very challenging objects to drink from and wouldn't want to use them. But that's for me, that's precisely the point. I understand what you're saying about something being functional and not managing things and how you use them and everything. And, I, and it just reminds me of the idea of preciousness. You know, so I, I always have a conflict with something that I fall in love with, an object, art, or any object. But then I then I think I'm wrong for making it so precious. Mm. You know? So I, I question all that stuff too. You know? <laughs>
Well, yeah, like knowing it's it's funny too because like I I spent like the whole morning prepping myself for like this interview, but I'm also still nervous knowing that like I'm actually being filmed right now, and like likewise, uh, I I feel the same way about painting on canvas. It's really hard for me to like motivate myself to paint on like nice canvas, even though this is like really nice paper that these are on. Um, specifically just because like in my head, I'm like, well, this has to be this big, fancy, profound thing. And yeah, I don't know, like uh, for me, the paper feels more closer to like the sketching, which I've always liked that more because it feels like, uh, it feels like something that's not performed afterwards. Um, in the way that like a lot of paintings that I would like, that I made in like undergrad and stuff were always based off of like tons of sketches for things and eventually I'm like, well that's a really cool one. Let's try to recreate that on here now. Mm -hmm. And then you create it on there and it's like, well, I liked the sketch better. <laughs> what did I like about the sketch that made it better than like this? It's it's harder like I feel like that's a hard thing to answer and like everyone has their own answers for that. And like to me that's like so interesting. Mm -hmm. Um because like I think a lot, uh, I think everyone has their own way of thinking about that, but everyone thinks about it differently. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Oh. <laughs>